<clears throat> thank you so much for the kind introduction and also for the uh, invitation to come. I really uh, am looking forward to the rest of the sessions. Um, I, I'm honored to be the first speaker, and I thought I would help frame the discussion by focusing on uh, the human brain in particular and how it may differ from animal systems that many of us, including myself, have used in the lab, especially the mouse. And so uh, with that in mind, I really thought I would focus uh, my talk almost entirely on both the normally developing human brain and models of human brain development. Um, with perhaps just one small exception, I thought my first slide should show you the mouse a little bit. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the mouse, uh, this is a cross-section of the progenitor zones in the developing mouse brain with radial glial cells lining the ventricle here shown in red and their daughter cells, these intermediate progenitors or basal progenitors that form another zone, the subventricular zone. And these two regions over time produce all of the neurons and also the glial cells in the developing mouse brain. And they represent the model that most of us are familiar with in terms of uh, neurogenesis, the early stages of brain development. Now, the human brain at early stages looks very much like the mouse. The same markers shown here highlight the radial glial cells and their intermediate progenitor daughters at early stages of human neurogenesis. But then things change very rapidly, mostly because of an increase in the size of the subventricular zone, which becomes enormous in the developing human brain and actually dominates because you can see the ventricular uh, zone, which is in red, becomes much more um, residual, as it were, during this stage. And this is gestation week 17 which is halfway through neurogenesis. That's about when layer four is being produced. So the upper cortical layers are mostly produced by cells in this progenitor region, this outer subventricular zone, which is not present in the mouse. And so we and others started looking uh, almost a decade ago now at the kinds of cells that are located in this outer subventricular zone and the mechanisms uh, by which they actually generate all those neurons in the usually expanded uh, human cortex. And so I want to highlight two cells in particular. Uh, one of them, shown here, uh, morphologically on the left, looks like a radial glial cell that many of us are familiar with. It has a uh, cell fiber, a basal fiber, that goes up to the, mostly to the cortical surface. But it doesn't have connections to the ventricle. It's not embedded in the adhesion belt. It's not really part of that neuroepithelium. Nonetheless, it's stained by all the markers that we're familiar with uh, for mouse radial glia. Intermediate filaments like bimentin and mestin, stem cell, neural stem cell markers like SOX2, all of them co-label these cells as well as the ventricular radioglia. But they're distinct in where they're located and their shape. And uh, as shown here on the right, if you backfill these basal fibers at later stages of brain development, most of those fibers will end in these cell bodies in this outer subventricular zone. The cells hadn't been described when we first uh, observed them, so we called them outer subventricular radial glia-like cells, or ORG cells, or ORG cells for short. I'll, I'll refer to them that way in my talk. They've more recently also been referred to as basal radial glia, but they're the same cell types. So what do we know about these cells? Well, one of the things we've been able to do at UCSF is actually image them in living cell slices. So these are slice cultures um, where we've labeled a, a virus that only, only uh, uh, is expressed in the progenitor population. So there are a lot of neurons in this area of the outer subventricular zone, but they're invisible because they're not labeled by this virus. The cells that are labeled are the progenitors. And over a period of 48 hours, most of them are uh, both dividing and migrating. And you can see they're highly radial. Uh, they're moving up toward the cortical plate where the neurons are, are uh, layering up, up here in the ceiling. Um, but these cells and their behavior are, are really very unique. And I want to spend the next few slides describing those unique features. First, the way they divide, a very unusual behavioral pattern where the cell body translocates along the basal fiber just prior to mitosis. So the cells move up and then they divide. And you can see it perhaps more easily here. And that distance can be over 100 microns, or roughly 80 to 100 microns, in about an hour. So it's a rather dramatic motion. And it hasn't been described before. We think it's characteristic of the cell type. And we call it mitotic somal translocation, or MST. And uh, a number of years ago, one of my uh, MD-PhD students started looking at the motors that drive this behavior. And I, I have to admit, my assumption was that there were microtubule motors causing it to jump. And so one of the first things we did is inhibit microtubules, thinking we could block this division. And the results shown here is, of course, as most of my ideas, totally wrong. So here on the left is a control. And on the right, we've used nicotazole to disaggregate the microtubules. And when these cells are ready to jump and divide, the uh, ones where the microtubules have been disaggregated actually jump almost twice as far as normal. So they move much further than the normal cells. And then having jumped, they fail to divide because the microtubules are required for spindles, and, uh, quite obvious. Um, it turns out, to make a long story short, that it's the non-muscle myosin II uh, that actually is involved in this uh, behavior. Uh, 
If we use blebistatin to block uh, actomycin fibers, control cells jump and divide, but the treated cells fail to move at all, although they later on go on and divide. So the driver for that movement is very different than uh, the mitotic somal translocation, the uh, interkinetic nuclear migration that occurs uh, just prior to cell division at the ventricle. Now I'll get back to the motors in, in just a minute. Now, uh, based on those studies and many others, we have a working model of how the human cortex differs from the mouse. And it looks something like this, where at the earliest stages, it's very much like a mouse. Radial glial cells make a daughter intermediate progenitor or basal progenitor. Those cells divide once to produce a pair of neurons. But then there's a very uh, quick switch to this more complicated stage where ventricular radial glia produce the outer radial glial cells, and they go through a series of asymmetrical divisions. Each time they self-renew and they produce a daughter, which is now a transit amplifying cell because it divides more than once to produce a clone of cells that we think are identical in cell type. And over time, these migrate into different layers and they uh, help make the cortex more complex in, in large brain mammals that contain uh, these outer radial glial-like cells. At the end of neurogenesis, a, area that, a period of time that hasn't been as well studied, uh, we have some evidence now that these uh, both ventricular and outer radial glia transform into astrocytes. That helps define them as neural stem cells. They make neurons and they also make glial cells. Uh, and we think that they actually produce different sets of different types of astrocytes uh, later on in the adult brain. And we may get into that later in the discussion if you'd like. So as I mentioned, the markers that we started using for these cells um, almost a decade ago were the same that had been developed in the mouse. But we were convinced that there must be new genes in these cell types that haven't been expressed in the mouse. And our, one of the approaches we used to try to discover those genes was single cell RNA sequencing, which at the time was relatively new, uh, but advances have moved so quickly that it's almost laughable. Our first study used only 250 cells, whereas now we and others are using millions of cells in, in drop seq methods to do single cell sequencing. But back then, which is, as I say, only seven or eight years ago, this was state of the art. Uh, we used a fluidine machine that actually uh, helped us with these microfluidic chips where we could capture up to about 80 or so cells at a time. And as I mentioned, we, we looked at human brain development with a relatively small population of under 300 cells. But that was enough to identify key genes expressed by the different classical cell types. Shown here in a, uh, what's known as a Tisney plot, it's a way of reducing the dimension dimensionality of the data and clustering cells according to genes they have in common, which we've color coded according to canonical gene expression. So in yellow are the norepithelial radial glia-like cells that are clustered because they share gene programs. Uh, the red cells are the intermediate progenitors that they produce. Uh, excitatory neurons are clustered here in blue, and the inhibitory neurons in the developing brain are here in black. So aside from just putting cell clusters together that represent cell types, uh, the genes and the networks that genes uh, signal are, are highly important and informative in terms of what's going on in each cell type. So to begin with, we've been able to identify new genes for old friends. For example, these on the left are genes our data set were predicted to be expressed in ventricular radial glia. And these are in situ hybridization studies confirming that these antibodies, uh, or rather the in situ hybridization shows that the RNA is expressed in these cells along the ventricle. On the right are the genes in our data set that were predicted to be identified with outer radial glia. And as you can see, the in situ hybridization stains cells in the outer subventricular zone, which is exactly where those cells are supposed to be. And uh, then we confirm their identity uh, by imaging cells uh, in sliced culture, fixing and staining for antibodies to those gene products. We also did some time lapse images. We saw cells jump, divide, and then fix them and showed that they also stain with, uh, with markers to those uh, gene proteins. So we now have a new set of tools that can be used to identify this outer radial glial cell in human and other uh, mammalian uh, species, including other primates. And I want to detour a little bit now because that new tool has allowed us insights not only into brain development but also into diseases, some of them expected and some unexpected. And I thought it would be informative just to spend a few minutes describing those. First, these new markers express um, different details of the anatomy of the cells that we didn't know before. So on the left in hop X, uh, shown here in red, uh, this is a gene expressed only by outer radial glia at these ages, and it highlights the cytoplasm. So I don't know if you can see this, but there are fibers these cells have that are stained red. Uh, in green, we've used a marker called cryo B, which is predicted to lane, uh, stain only the ventricular radial glia, which, as you can see, the cell bodies are here, but it also stains their fibers. And at these ages, gestation week 18 or up until around 18, we would expect both green and red fibers to go all the way up to the cortex, and that's what we find. But beyond this age, we see the green fibers don't make it to the cortex. They end in the outer subventricular zone, and only red fibers, ORG fibers, go up to the cortical plate. 
And that suggested a discontinuous glial scaffold, which was different than the model, typical model in, uh, development would predict. And so we tested this. We, we went to cortical sections that were very thick, and we stained them with dye I, which is a lipophilic dye that gets transported along these fibers. Now, if you put those crystals on the surface or the ventricular side, either way, at these earlier ages, we had fibers that were going all the way from the ventricle to the cortex. These are the continuous radioglial fibers that we would expect and that you find during corticogenesis in the mouse. But just a week or two later, doing the same experiment, dye crystals on the surface only stain these outer radioglial fibers that end in cell bodies in the outer subventricular zone. And putting those same crystals at the ventricle uh, gave a complementary picture. We could see these ventricular fibers that ended also in the outer subventricular zone, confirming what we so deduced from these marker studies and leading to a model of cortical development that's a little different than uh, the traditional one, which is shown here schematically. So we now think that the earlier stages of development, where there's a continuous glial scaffold, looks very much like the mouse. Neurons are born in the ventricular and subventricular zones. They migrate up and they form the deeper cortical layers, layers five and six. But then a switch occurs around middle period of neurogenesis when uh, ventricular radioglia give rise to a large number of outer radioglia, and they are generated by horizontal divisions, which means that the ventricular cells left behind lose their fibers. Those fibers get inherited by the ORG cells. And then what happens is the ORG cells produce and also guide the migration of the upper cortical layer neurons. So the upper cortical layers, which are produced later, have a different lineage, actually, than the deeper cortical layers. And we think that may be important because the upper cortical layers are the cells that are the association neurons, the ones that are responsible for higher cognitive function. And they also uh, have unique features in primate brain. Uh, it's been described as a supergranular um, feature that's, that's primate-specific. And that is the density of cells is higher and the assumed diversity of cell types. And we think that relates to the fact that their lineages are different. And then the final thing I want to mention is we now have three different types of defined radioglia. There are the ventricular radioglia, the outer radioglia, and we think these, the cells that are left behind, regrow fibers that end on blood vessels. And so they're morphologically, uh, molecularly, and we think also functionally distinct from the other radioglia. And so these we're now calling truncated radioglia. So at least three, three different cell types of, of neural progenitor cells in the developing human brain. Now, many of us are using human models of uh, brain development in vitro to study diseases. And so I thought I would spend some time through my talk talking about these human organoid brain models, both their advantages and some of the uh, challenges. So first thing I want to mention is that these outer uh, radioglia do uh, uh, develop in uh, human organoids, both in protocols that we've used and others. I think Rick Livesey may have been the first to actually show this. Uh, but in our lab, we've been taking uh, iPS cells from humans, growing them into organoids, and doing single-cell RNA sequencing uh, week by week. And by week 10 to 15, we start to see genes emerging that have the signature of these outer radioglial cells. And at the same ages, if you take sections of those organoids and do time-lapse imaging with the same vectors I showed you earlier, uh, we can stain cells that look just like outer radioglia, and they jump and divide with that characteristic behavior I've mentioned before. This is a looped film of cells dividing over and over again but you can see how it jumps and divides, just like these cells in, in fetal brain. In fact, the kinetics of that movement are exactly the same. Uh, so that allows us to look at whether these cells are involved in specific uh, diseases. And we're especially interested in those diseases of early brain development. And I thought I'd highlight this one, which is probably known to most of you, lysencephaly, where uh, humans are born, unfortunately, with a smooth surface of the cortex that doesn't develop the characteristic folds that it would normally have. And there's several versions of this depending on the genes that are uh, missing. Uh, this is an example of the most severe case, which is known as miller deeker lysencephaly, where there's an uh, actual uh, truncation of the short arm of one of the chromosomes, and a, over a dozen genes are, are gone. And it leads to a very severe form of uh, lysencephaly with also some microcephaly as well. The brain is smaller than usual. So we managed to get skin samples from several patients with this disorder as well as controls. And uh, we're able to grow organoids. And, study a variety of different progenitors and their behavior and their kinetics um, for both normals and patients with this very severe form of lysencephaly. And they have several de defects, which I'm not going to mention, but the one I wanted to highlight is uh, a defect of outer radioglia. And uh, it's one that you may have been familiar with because I mentioned it just a few minutes ago. What we found is that in the lysencephaly brains, when the cells, the outer radioglial cells, jump and divide, they jump farther than usual, and then they arrested in division or took hours instead of minutes to undergo mitosis. So that's the same phenotype we saw when we blocked microtubules earlier on. And it is not a surprise, because we know that LIS1, which is the main gene causing lysencephaly, uh, 
and many of the other lysencephaly genes are microtubule associated. And so a microtubule defect is not a, a, a surprising, but finding it selectively in outer radioglial cells was a surprise because the ventricular radioglia had no problem with their interkinetic nuclear migration and division, nor did the intermediate progenitors or the transit amplifying cells. It was only the outer radioglia that had this problem. And so I think this links this cell type, the outer radioglial cell, with brain expansion and cortical folding. Not that it's the cause for folding, but I think it's required for big brains uh, and, and it's involved in some way in, in those features, especially uh, cortical folding and, and uh, increase in brain size. And also this is a kind of a defect that uh, had not been observed and probably couldn't have been observed uh, in mouse models. Now the genes that I mentioned that are markers for these cells are not just markers, they're genes that are expressed uniquely in the cell type because of, of signaling pathways that are expressed by those cells. And the coherence of those genes uh, uh, was really striking. They fit into just these relatively small process, a handful of processes. These are the genes that are uniquely expressed by radio, uh, outer radioglia. And they include genes associated with extracellular matrix production, the epithelial mesenchymal transition, which we think is how these cells arise, and stem cell maintenance because they, they form their own niche at a distance from the ventricle. So the genes involved in all these different processes uh, were very interesting to us. We went to the literature and time and again, we found that all of these genes enriched in outer radioglial cells had previously been highlighted in this disease, glioblastoma multiforme, a terrible uh, disease of, of the adult brain. You usually have to be over the age of 50 to develop this tumor. It's uh, very aggressive and untreatable um, and it's, it's a somewhat mysterious in terms of its uh, origin. So these glioblastoma cells seem to have uh, the same gene patterns that we found in this one type of fetal progenitor cell. So we were able to get some surgical samples from our colleagues at UCSF, which we also use single cell analysis on, and found that the most aggressive form, the so-called mesenchymal glioblastomas highlighted here, all had the same gene signatures for outer radioglial cells uh, in their diverse cell population. These are very diverse tumors. But they did contain what appeared, at least genetically or molecularly, to, to possibly be outer radioglial-like cells. And so we managed to take some fresh tissue, section it, stain it, and culture it, shown here with the same uh, markers that we used in our fetal tissue. And if you look at, for example, this uh, one cell with my little arrow pointing to it, um, in time-lapse images, it has the morphology and the behavior of these fetal cells I mentioned before. So it appears that ORG-like cells are present in these glioblastomas. They look like ORG cells, they behave like ORG cells, they're molecularly very similar. And so that's uh, led to a series of uh, investigations. We're now collaborating with others at UCSF to try to look more carefully at what this might mean. And what I'm showing here are some genes that are expressed in the sort of the candidate cell types that are thought to be the uh, potential uh, seeders or precursors for this tumor. And they include uh, fibrous uh, astrocytes, protoplasmic astrocytes, uh, adult oligodendrocytes, OPCs. Uh, these are fetal OPCs, which are a little different and then radioglial cells and intermediate progenitors. So these are all the dividing cells in the developing brain, which we're comparing uh, in terms of gene expression shown above with uh, glioblastomous tumors. And the ones with the highest uh, similarity are the radioglial cells, indirectly suggesting that radioglia may have a role to play in uh, the formation of these tumors. And if we look at the uh, coordinated gene networks that are expressed specifically by these ORG-like cells in the tumors, which is a network of genes shown here on the right, in brown, the hub genes are similar. In fact, these are the ones that are also found in outer radioglia. And the most highly enriched is this one, PTPRZ1, which we find highly expressed in ORG cells, but also very highly expressed in these ORG-like cells in glioblastoma tumors. And that caught, us, caught our attention because of this study, which was published uh, just a year ago, where uh, based on the fact that this gene, PTPRZ1, is highly enriched in glioblastoma, these investigators knocked it down to see what functional effect it might have. And in normal uh, glioblastoma tumors injected into mice, they grew, as shown here, infecting large parts of the brain of the mice. But if they knocked down PTPRZ1 and then took their tumor cells, human tumors, and put them into the mice, they either uh, grew very slowly or they failed to grow at all or spread. So PTPRZ1 and uh, drugs that knock it down are now being used in clinical trials. So it's been related to the spread of the tumor itself um, so we've knocked it down in fetal outer radioglial cells and showed that it also reduces their ability to, gr to grow fibers and jump. So we think that uh, that feature of the outer radioglial cell may help explain the very aggressive nature of these tumors. And another way we've started to look at that is by taking our tumor samples and extracting the ORG-like cells. We now have a fax system that allows us to do this. So we have enriched and depleted tumors 
of these ORG cells. And we then injected them into mice to see if we can recapitulate the entire tumor. Um, and that seems to take months to happen. It doesn't always work. So we've also put them into organoids. And in just two weeks, in these organoids, we can test this uh, hypothesis because the PTRPs you want enrich tumor cells invade the, tumor, the organoids very nicely and they, they reproduce and spread widely. The depleted cells uh, don't do quite as well. And we've, done the, the, we've then done single cell RNA sequencing uh, of these organoids, uh, looking just at the human cells that we've grafted. And the tumor cells uh, in these organoids now have recapitulated the diversity of cell types in the original organoid, suggesting that uh, these PTPRZ1 enriched autoradial allele cells uh, may by themselves be able to reconstitute the rest of the tumor. And so this supports the idea that they may be cells of origin for some of these glioblastomas. Now, since that original 250 cell cluster that I showed you earlier, we and others have now been looking at much larger single cell RNA sequencing sets. And this is one of the studies that we published not long ago where we studied multiple brain regions over development, uh, did single cell sequencing, and then looked at a larger, more diverse population of cells, which are shown here in a much larger Tisney plot. And this includes uh, other cell types uh, besides the neurons and glia. We find endothelial cells, uh, astrocytes, and, and also activated and non-activated microglia and so on. Um, and also, of course, more diverse cell types, upper and deeper layer neurons and so on that we didn't see in our original data set. In addition to just looking at individual genes, we've also done something that uh, Dan Geshwin uh, has helped introduce, which is weighted gene expression network analysis. This allows you to look at those gene modules I've hinted at earlier that are coordinated and that are uh, expressed in certain cell types because of signaling path pathways or cascades that are uh, actually uh, important for cell function. So those two ways of looking at these cells has uh, really highlighted to us unique features of these adorated glia, which again is the main theme of my talk, and I wanted to go back to that. So these are uh, schematically some of the membrane uh, proteins that we now think are unique to these adorated glial cells. And I want to talk about two in particular, two signaling pathways. One of them is the LIFR STAT3 signaling pathway, which is common in many other stem cell uh, organs and systems as part of a self-renewal program. It happens to be uh, in these early stages in human development only expressed in these adorated glial cells. We could only see these uh, genes as expressed in this pathway co-expressed in, in the SOX2 outer radial glia, not in the uh, TBR2 or EOMS positive intermediate progenitors, for example. So the only cells in this outer subventricular zone that are enriched in this signaling pathway are the outer radial glia. Now LIFR, for those of you who don't know, is leukemia inhibiting factor receptor. So this is a receptor for leukemia inhibiting factor. And it's expressed uniquely by outer radial glia. So we, and also I met, must mention Ben Novich at UCLA, have taken advantage of that feature in our data set uh, to see if we can tweak organoids to produce more of these adorated glial cells. So this is an, one of our normal organoids that has some, as I mentioned earlier, of adorated glia. They're stained in HOPX. Some of these little red cells are the adorated glia in a control organoid. But we take those organoids and then treat them with LIF, that is leukemia inhibiting factor, to activate this receptor that's involved presumably in self-renewal. After two weeks of LIF exposure in these organoids, we have a massive increase in the number of HOPX positive adorated glia-like cells in the organoids. And if we take these out over a longer period of time, we have an increase in the number of upper cortical layer neurons. So it's an example of how we can use some of the information about the signaling pathways of the cell type as a sort of a tool, in this case, to what we think is improve the organoids, to try to make them a little bit more like what normally happens in development, and in this case, actually uh, amplify a cell population that we think is very important uh, for normal brain development, which is present normally, but not, not as much as it should be. And the other pathway I wanted to highlight, which is very relevant to some of the diseases I think we'll be hearing about in this uh, symposium, is the mTOR signaling pathway. And there's a whole range of uh, activators and negative regulators of that pathway. Some of those genes are highlighted here. Uh, and this is a different way of, of actually showing our, uh, our, our single cell data over time. But the important point is that these are all pathway genes for this mTOR signaling pathway that are enriched or uniquely expressed in human outer rate of glial cells. And then to confirm that, we took cortical sections of uh, fetal brain and then stained them for uh, markers of activated uh, mTOR signaling, including this phosphorylated S6 protein, which is expressed in the outer subventricular zone. I hope you can see all these little blue dots and co-expressed by uh, ORG cells to the point where you can actually see their morphology very nicely. Here you can see the basal fiber highlighted by the presence of this activated mTOR signaling protein. Uh, and, and, you know, the reason that's interesting to us is because mTOR signaling has been implicated in diseases, including autism, tuberous sclerosis, and macrocephaly. Uh, so we managed to get some 
tissues from one of those disorders, focal cortical dysplasia, which is shown here. Uh, these uh, dysplasias are highlighted by balloon cells, these large uh, abnormal cell types, which it turns out also co-express mTOR signaling in rich genes, including, as you can see here, the readout of activated mTOR signaling. So that got us to wonder if maybe ORG-like cells might be represented in, in this malformation. So we managed to get some fresh tissue, section it, uh, do nuclear sequencing, and show that HOPX, the outer radioglial marker, is also co-expressed by these mTOR-enriched uh, outer radio, uh, 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 balloon cell types. And we've done single-cell RNA sequencing of these uh, cortical dysplasias. And just to highlight one cluster, uh, we call it number 33 here, we think this is the ORG-like cell cluster, which also uh, is co-labeling the uh, balloon cells in the tumors. These are some of the genes that are uh, common both to these uh, cortical malformations and to outer radioglial cells. So we also think there may be a relationship to the outer radioglial cells to this form of uh, cortical malformation. And then the final thing I wanted to end with has to do with evolution. Because if we're studying human-specific features of brain development, it, it almost naturally leads into an understanding of what makes the human brain so different or unique. And, and in order to study that question, you really have to compare the developing human brain to the nearest living uh, uh, relative to humans, namely the chimpanzee brain, to look at human-specific features. The problem with that is that we really don't have access to fetal uh, chimpanzee tissue. So Alex Pollan, who joined my lab, he's an evolutionary biologist, was very interested in developing organoids to actually address that problem. And so it took a few years, but he developed a protocol to make organoids from humans as well as from great apes and chimps and, and gorillas. Uh, that works very nicely, as shown here, to produce organoids that are quite comparable from humans across these other uh, uh, primate species. Uh, we confirmed that we can get uh, the cells to overlie very nicely bioinformatically from both chimpanzee, uh, macaque, and human, uh, also uh, from organoids as well as primary tissue. So that uh, reassured us that we could look at the same cell types across these different species during development. Um, but we did notice some differences between organoids and primary tissue, which I wanted to highlight. One of them is that the organoids uh, are enriched in stresses, uh, like glycolysis genes. And those are shown here on the right in these violin plots in organoids from humans and non-human primates compared to primary macaque and primary human on the left. So these are genes that are only expressed or highly enriched in organoids, not in primary tissue. And they're all involved in stress, uh, metabolic stress. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress, which is a different type of stress pathway involved in protein folding, also highly enriched in the organoids and not in primary tissue. So these organoids are really under much more metabolic stress than normal tissue. And that's something to keep in mind when you're trying to model diseases using these organoids. Uh, the other feature that we found is the number of genes that are uniquely expressed in different cell types in organoids are just a fraction of the types we find in primary tissue. So for example, we found almost 600 defining genes of cortical neuron types from primary tissue in human, as in this case, just looking at human brain. In the organoids, we only found around 46 of such defining genes. And if we look at the genes that are expressed in both organoids and primary tissue, it's an even smaller fraction. So these cells are not as diverse as the primary tissue cells. And that's highlighted here. There's a much higher diversity of cell types, almost of every cell type, in primary tissue than in the organoids. And some of those gene differences are expressed in cells from different brain regions. It seems like the organoids, uh, instead of being highly focused in a particular area, express a kind of a generic, uh, almost non-localized gene expression pattern. And we can talk about more of those differences if you'd like. But the good news is that the major cell types highlighted here, radial glia, intermediate progenitors, excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, can be identified in all these organoids. And uh, although the gene the highest gene expression levels may differ. The, uh, uh, the hub genes that form their modules of gene expression are very, very much the same. And that allows us to do what we wanted to do, namely look at the same cell type in uh, human compared to uh, non-human primates. And we found genes that are uniquely expressed by human cells at ages where the, mice, uh, the uh, monkeys don't express them. And these are two examples, ETNK1, highly enriched in human primary tissue, human organoids, but not in chimpanzee or macaque. And this is another gene similarly that's expressed in human radioglia, but not uh, non-human primate radioglia. And this is the inverse. These are genes that are expressed in the macaque and the chimpanzee, but have been lost in human evolution somewhere in the last six million years because they're not expressed in human outer radioglia. So this now allows us to look at human-specific genes. And I want to go back to the mTOR signaling pathway I mentioned earlier. 
And these are some of those genes in the mTOR signaling pathway. And this is a uh, heat map showing the gene expression in human fetal tissue. And as I mentioned earlier, these are genes enriched in outer radioglia in human primary tissue. To the right, uh, we have human organoids, shown here in brown. These human organoids also express these same mTOR uh, genes enhanced in outer radioglia. But you'll notice the macaque and the chimpanzee don't have enrichment in these genes. And this is something we confirmed going back into tissue, uh, shown here quantitatively. mTOR signaling is highly enriched in human outer radioglia, but not in chimpanzee or in monkey. So this is a human-specific feature, uh, one that we've also uh, looked at a little more carefully. Uh, and in our gene set, we find two receptors that mediate mTOR signaling that are found in human outer radioglia, uniquely, not in the monkey. And if you knock those down uh, in human, you can see that they're very important in uh, contributing to this upregulation of mTOR signaling. So we think we're starting to have an explanation for why this is the case. But what I wanted to leave you with is the notion that mTOR signaling, which is important, we think, for many diseases, uh, may be a feature that's unique in human outer radioglia, which means that not only is it difficult to model in a mouse, it might, not, it might also be difficult to model in non-human primates, including uh, marmosets and other, other monkeys. And so this is another issue that uh, I think we have to keep in mind when we're looking at disease models in vitro. So that's my talk, and I just wanted to leave you with several conclusions. Uh, first, there's a greater diversity of radioglia uh, neural stem cell subtypes in humans than you find in mouse. Uh, that we've been able to use a combined comparative analysis of both primary and organoid models to study evolution, but also I think uh, more and more it will be used for studying diseases. And I also want to mention that the single cell sequencing technology, which has really developed in the last uh, decade or less, uh, has really revolutionized our approach to understanding the composition and the function of cell types in brain and, and human brain development. And then, of course, the people in my lab who did the work are all mentioned here. Alex Pollan and Tom Nowakowski uh, were really critical for single cell sequencing for me. Uh, they both have started their own labs at UCSF. And then uh, current postdocs who contributed are shown here on the right, Madeline Andrews, uh, Aparna Budari, who's been a terrific bioinformatician as well as a uh, neuroscientist and Lizzie uh, DeLulo, and then our uh, funding agencies, especially the NIH Brain Initiative. And thank you for your attention. I'm curious to know whether there's a relationship between the jumping behavior and mTORC, and whether you need that kind of um, extra energy, if you like. Sure. So we, are, of course, are very now, now we are very interested in what the role of mTORC signaling might be in, uh, in these uh, outer radioglial cells. So we have been knocking it down periodically, uh, 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 systematically, including the receptors I mentioned earlier, and looking at the cells in a number of different ways. And what I can say is that it's, uh, as you probably know, mTOR signaling is involved in uh, growth pathways. And one of the things we thought might be involved in mTOR signaling might have to do with proliferation and the uh, ability of these cells to uh, increase cell number. Uh, but instead, we find that it's mostly the cytoskeletal uh, structure of these cells that gets affected when you inhibit mTOR signaling. So there are changes in the basal fibers, changes in the behavior of the cells when we look at them in, in dy dynamic imaging uh, movies. So we think it's affecting their um, behavior more in, in terms of migration and uh, indirectly proliferation, but it's mostly a cytoskeletal uh, structural change that we see when we block the mTOR signaling pathway. And we're still, those are ongoing studies. We've really just started. So I, I don't know much more than that, um, but it's turning out to be more cytoskeletal than growth pathways that are involved. Hello, um, I'm interested in the uh, diversity or la the lack of diversity of the cell population in the organoids. Uh, do you think it's due to some difference in the maturity compared to the fetal brain that you compare it to? Or maybe that the fact that the organoids um, only recapitulate some parts of the cortex and maybe is lacking other parts of the brain like the diencephalon? Sure. So it's difficult to know why, you know, we see what we see, but I can certainly give you a little more detail on what we are seeing, um, and that is that there's a maturation that uh, we can see matches very nicely what happens in normal brain development. And this has been reported by multiple labs that these cells over time will produce deep layer cells, then upper layer cells, and then if you keep them long enough, they'll start switching to a gliogenic program. And, and that's the same time course of normal brain development. So, we, so that's nicely preserved or reasonably well preserved. And the major cell types, as I mentioned, are also well preserved. But when you dig deeper into the genes that ex are expressed by individual cell types, they, they they show patterns that you don't see it, we never see actually in, in normal fetal brain. So we think there's a kind of a confused gene program. There are some genes that 
don't turn off when they should, and others that are expressed that probably shouldn't have been expressed at those ages. Um, and, and that's especially true for uh, genes that are aerial specific, that are regional specific. So we see a kind of a generic rather than a highly uh, regionalized uh, gene expression pattern. I should mention that we see much more diversity in uh, position tangentially, sort of aerial position, than laminar position. So um, all the uh, cells in fetal tissue, but more so in organoids, fall into just two categories in terms of laminar position, either upper or deeper cortical layers, which actually I think to be more precise, uh, uh, cerebral subcerebral projecting and cerebral cerebral projecting. So it has more to do with where they're targeted, but we see mainly two major classes of excitatory cells. But within those classes, we see many more subtypes based on what regional genes they express. And that's missing in the organoids. The organoids seem to be just producing a kind of a generic excitatory upper or deeper layer cell. So what that means in terms of uh, you know, disease modeling that people are doing is, is hard to say. What it comes from, why it happens, is even more difficult. But we wonder if the stress that these organoids are under might have something to do with the fate of the cells that are being produced. And that's a tractable problem. I think it's, it, it can be solved. You can tweak the media and, and try to improve the glycolysis uh, pathway enrichment. And, and that may actually help make these cells a little bit more faithful to their normal counterpart. But that's just an idea. Don't know yet. Hello, Arnold. Um, have you done the single cell sequencing on um, early human brains, like uh, before gestational week 15? And, and if so, does it look more like mice? Yes. So we've uh, just been extending, as you suggest, we've, we've now been extending our studies at earlier and later stages. Earlier stages uh, through collaborations in UK and Europe where we can get fetal tissues at those ages donated. And then later stages because we can do nuclear sequencing at later ages and then look at areas of... of time periods of gliogenesis. At the earlier stages, we're uh, identifying gene signatures for the neuroepithelial cell population. So the radioglia that I mentioned are neurogenic. They derive from neuroepithelial cells at earlier stages that we think are expanding the so-called um, uh, um, uh, what's the, the founder population and prior to the actual onset of neurogenesis. So we're at stages, we, we now have cells at those earlier stages that allow us to look at genes that are not only markers for those cell types, but that are involved in the transition from neuropathelial to radioglia. And we think that's a really important transition. It may have a lot to do with brain evolution and expansion. And so with a new set of genes to look at, we're hoping to explore some of those issues now. But, uh, but uh, most of that data set is just being uh, collected. I should mention that we're part of a consortium, the Brain Initiative Grants in the US, that uh, require that we publish all the data, the data sets, as they're acquired. So uh, there are updates periodically to the data sets. Uh, we're using, a, uh, I think, a very friendly server and interface that's being produced by uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. And um, anyone who wants can look at our most recent paper. There's an uh, address there which allows you to actually access those data and look at those genes yourself. Yeah, question right at the back. Uh, thanks, Arnold, for a great talk. Uh, so you've given us this sort of sense of uh, a key evolutionary innovation was the development of outer radial glia. And presumably there's a core developmental program that will instruct the development of that cell type. Could you convert a mouse radial glia to an outer radial glia? Do you think you're getting a, an insight into what that program is underlying the development of ORG? Yeah, so there, uh, there's been a lot of interest in, uh, I could say, excitement about doing that. Um, and uh, not so much from our lab, but from other labs now. People have been uh, reintrodu not reintroducing, but uh, expressing or overexpressing some of the genes that we've highlighted in outer radial glia in these mouse cells. Now, I should mention the mouse does have an outer radial glia-like cell. We and a group in Japan showed uh, many years ago that there are cells that behave just like I showed you, that jump and divide, and in the mouse brain, they're located in that outer subventricular zone. And once we had markers like HOPX, uh, we now say that we can say that these cells also express HOPX. So they are ORG-like cells in the mouse. Uh, they're different than the human cells, but they're present. So we can say that, you know, maybe 200 million years of evolution have included uh, the development of the cell type from early stages. Uh, but it, it's close enough to the, to the human version that what you suggest is, is probably going to happen, that people can convert uh, those mouse outer radial glia to more and more human-like outer radial glia by the expression of some of these gene programs. And uh, that's started already. People are publishing papers that suggest that's the case. And I think it's an area to watch because I think it'll happen. So eventually you'll be able to model the human brain better in the mouse, but that'll really be because of a better understanding of the human brain first. <laughs>
All right, final question. Yeah. A little bit along the same line. So you showed two pathways that are uh, act particularly active in outer radiolia, leaf and uh, mTOR. And you showed that treating uh, organoids with leaf enrich in, in outer radiolia. So I was wondering whether you try the same kind of manipulation with mTOR, trying to, to treat organoids and whether that enrich uh, in outer radiolia and whether there is a synergy between those two pathways or whether this. Yes, it's a very good question. So we haven't, um, some others in the audience may know this, but we haven't really looked at mTOR signaling pathways uh, that carefully in our organoids yet. Um, we, you know, focused on looking at the uh, ORG cell type rather than, uh, you know, the signaling pathways that are activated in, in organoids. Um, but you raise a very important question. You know, are these ORG-like cells in organoids, especially the ones that we can now uh, uh, enhance in numbers, uh, do they also reflect the same kind of metabolic changes that we see or unique features? And uh, I think that's un unanswered by us, but maybe by some other people already. And it's clearly one of these uh, questions that are going to be answered very soon. Um, but I do think that the organoids can be improved and that in the end they will turn out to be even better models for modeling human disease. But I think those of us who work on organoids are, should pay more attention to what goes on in, in the primary tissue in order to really interpret what you're seeing. Well, thank you so much, Arnold, for a brilliant start.